when researching for these videos, quite often I will come across things that are fascinating, but that don't fit very well in a script. This can be for any number of reasons, though I often try to at least work some of it in. This video is a classic example of something that didn't fit, but that I will put up anyway. More specifically, this is the report on HMS Repulse's sinking by her captain, one William Tennant, a man probably more famous for his actions at Dunkirk. Nonetheless, his report, contained in R.A. Burt's British Battleships 1919-1945, through is an excellent first-hand account of the sinking. From the mouth of the man who commanded her that fateful day. The man who had such excellent seamanship that she dodged 19 torpedoes. I will be presenting his report verbatim and without further comment beyond what I have already said. I believe it is important for the historical record that such things are preserved in more ways than one, and I figure that my viewers would find it interesting. Or so I hope, though I would be unsurprised if this doesn't exactly break view records. I will also note I butchered the name of a destroyer and definitely butchered Malaysian place names, so I apologize for that in advance. With all of that out of the way, Captain William Tennant's report on the sinking of HMS Repulse. We spent October and November on what really amounted to a yachting trip in the South Indian Ocean, and during this time had two short visits to Durban, when I think the ship's company enjoyed themselves more than at any other port they visited. Toward the end of November, we found ourselves rushed off to Ceylon. Repulse was lying at Trincomalee, and I got a signal from the CNC Eastern Fleet, who had then arrived at Colombo in Prince of Wales, telling me that he had to fly on to Singapore to attend a conference there, and that I had to take the Eastern Fleet there. This consisted of Prince of Wales, Repulse, four destroyers, Electra, Express, Jupiter, and Encounter. We arrived by 1st December. There was a great flourish of trumpets and much publicity by the press about our arrival and how we had command of the seas in these waters. Before I go further, many of us are hesitant to attribute blame for the loss of the two capital ships, but I would like to tell the inner history of this political move. Japan was getting more troublesome, and both the British and U.S. foreign offices, and also the local government on the spot, declared that if we only showed force and sent some capital ships to the Far East, Japan would pipe down. There was no time to collect a balanced fleet of aircraft carriers, cruisers, destroyers, etc., and so to a large extent we were bluffing, and in this case, our bluff was called. The Prime Minister practically admitted this in the House of Commons, so do not be tempted to attribute blame hastily to the Air Ministry or the Air Forces on the spot, for this would be, I think, unfair. A week after arrival of the Eastern Fleet, war was declared and the Japanese started bombing our aerodromes on the north coast of Malaya and also carried out landings there. The question we all asked in the ships lying there at the naval base was, what are we going to do about it? How could we remain sitting in Singapore Harbor with the enemy landing on our shores? So the CNC, Admiral Phillips, after asking for such air protection as could be provided, did the only possible thing. He went to sea and tried to cut their communications between Indochina and the northeast coast of Malaya, along which route convoys of troops were running. Just before dark on Monday, 8th December, Prince of Wales, Repulse, Electra, Express, Vampire, and Tenedos sailed from the naval base with the intention I have just mentioned. It was about 30 hours run to reach our objective off the northeast coast of Malaya, where it was intended to arrive near dawn. The convoys and any shipping we would find, and then sweeping down the coast at 26 knots, and so home. The next day at sea, except that it was warm, was very much NS weather. Low clouds and heavy rainstorms, visibility sometimes down to half a mile. This was a great advantage to us, as we did not wish to be located by Japanese aircraft. However, at about 1645 hours, the sky cleared considerably, and the force was soon being shadowed by at least three aircraft. We were then steaming to the north, which the Admiral continued to do until dark, where he made a large alteration of course to the west, increasing speed to 26 knots, with the intention of shaking off our shadowers. At about 8 o'clock, I got a signal from him saying that as we were being shadowed, he had decided to cancel the operation, 
For if we now persisted and went into the enemy landings the next morning, we should probably find our ships heavily attacked by submarines, aircraft, and possibly destroyers, and so we started to return home. A few hours after we had turned back, a report was received saying that a landing was taking place at Kuantan. Now, Kuantan is only 150 miles from Singapore, whereas Sengarj and Katibaru, where we had intended to be at dawn, are some 400 miles from Singapore. The Admiral decided to investigate this landing at Kuantan on his way back, and to arrive off that place at dawn. This we did, and found nothing, but at about 6.30 hours, Repulse sighted a reconnaissance aircraft, which I reported by flags to the Prince of Wales. This, I think, was the aircraft who put the torpedo bombers onto us, for they arrived some four hours later, which would allow for them to come from South Indochina. At about 10.45, we went to first degree HA readiness. Repulse's RDF shortly after picked up formations of enemy aircraft. The first aircraft we sighted, about 1100 hours. I will now describe the various phases of aircraft attack, which finally caused the destruction of the Repulse and Prince of Wales. They are divided in five separate attacks, with varying periods between them. The intervals between these periods were between 10 and 20 minutes, but the period between the fourth and fifth attack was very short. The first attack developed shortly after 1100 hours, when nine aircraft in close single line abreast formation were seen approaching Repulse from just about green 50 and of a height of about 10,000 feet. Fire was at once opened on them with the long-range HA by Prince of Wales and Repulse. It was very soon obvious that the attack was to be entirely concentrated on Repulse. The formation was very well kept, and bombs were dropped with great accuracy. One near miss on the starboard side of Brest B turret, and one hit on the port hangars, burst on the armor below the Marines' mess deck, and caused minor damage. The remainder of the salvo, it was thought seven bombs, were dropped altogether. It fell very close to the port side, and this concluded this attack. There was now a short lull of about 20 minutes, during which the damage control parties carried out their duties in a most efficient manner, and fires which had been started by this bomb had all been got under control before the next attack. And the bomb having burst on the armor, no damage was suffered below in the engine or boiler rooms. It is thought that the bombs dropped were about 250 pounds. The second attack was shared by Prince of Wales and Repulse, and was made by torpedo bomber aircraft. They appeared to be the same type of machine, believed to be Mitsubishi 86 or 88. I am not prepared to say how many machines took part in this attack, but on its conclusion, I had the impression that we had succeeded in combing the tracks of a large number of torpedoes, possibly as many as 12. We were steaming at 25 knots at the time. I made a steady course until the aircraft appeared to be committed to the attack, when the wheel was put over and the attacks providentially combed. I would like to record here the valuable work done by all the bridge personnel at this time in calmly pointing out approaching torpedo bombers, which largely contributed to our good fortune in dodging all these torpedoes. Prince of Wales was hit on the port side right aft during this attack, and a large column of water appeared to be thrown up, larger than subsequent columns of water, which were thrown up when Repulse was hit later on. The third attack was a high-level bombing attack, again concentrated on Repulse. Possibly the enemy were aware, and particularly if they were using 250-pound bombs, that these bombs would have little chance of penetrating Prince of Wales' horizontal armor. I was maneuvering at high speed at the time, and we were actually under helm when the bombs fell. No hits were received. There was one near miss on the starboard side, and the remainder fell clear of the port side. The attack was carried out in the same determined manner as was the first. At this time, Prince of Wales appeared to be in trouble, and had, not under control, balls hoisted. I made a signal to C&C about her damage, but got no reply, and at that time made an emergency report to Singapore that the enemy aircraft were bombing, followed immediately by an amplifying report, which was just about to be transmitted at the time the ship sank. The fourth attack now started to develop, and about eight aircraft were seen low on the horizon on the starboard bow. Being low down, it signified another torpedo attack impending. When about three miles away, they split into two formations, 
and I estimated that those on the right hand would launch their torpedoes first, and I started to swing the ship to starboard. The torpedoes were dropped at a distance of 2,500 yards, and it seemed obvious that we should be once more successful in combing their tracks. The left-hand formation appeared to be making straight for Prince of Wales, who was at the time abaft my port beam. When these aircraft were a little before my port beam, at a distance of approximately 2,000 yards, they turned straight at me and fired their torpedoes. It now became obvious that if these torpedoes were aimed at repulse, they would almost certainly hit, as any other alteration to course would have caused me to be hit by the tracks of those torpedoes I was in the process of combing. One torpedo fired from my port side was obviously going to hit the ship, and it was possible to watch its tracks for about one and a half minutes before the act took place. The ship was hit amidships port side. The ship stood this torpedo well, and continued to maneuver and steam at about 25 knots. There was now only a very short respite before the final and last attack. Torpedo bombers appeared from all directions, and a second torpedo hit the ship in the vicinity of the gun room, and apparently jammed the rudder and although the ship was still steaming at over 20 knots, she was not under control. Shortly after this, at least three torpedoes hit the ship, two on the port side and one on the starboard side. I knew she could not survive, and at once gave the order for everyone to come on deck and cast off loose Carly floats. When these final two or three torpedoes detonated, the ship rapidly took a list to port. Men were now pouring onto the deck. They had all been warned 24 hours before to carry or wear their life-saving gear. When the ship had a 30-degree list, I looked over the starboard side of the bridge and saw the commander and 200 to 300 men collect on the starboard side. I never saw the slightest sign of panic. I told them from the bridge how well they had fought the ship and wished them good luck. The ship hung for at least 1 to 2 minutes with a list of about 60 to 70 degrees to port and then rolled over. Destroyers Vampire and Electra closed to pick up survivors. When I was in the water, I first saw our fighters appear. My signal, enemy aircraft bombing, was in the hands of the Air Vice Marshal, and about 25 minutes and 6 minutes later, the fighters left the ground, and they covered the 150 miles to reach our point in another 40 minutes. About 900 survivors were picked up from Repulse, which was wonderful considering the speed at which the old ship went down at the end. She was 26 years old. About 400 men and officers were lost. In conclusion, looking back at the action, I think that if 50 or 60 well-trained torpedo bombers can be launched to attack capital ships who are without adequate aircraft protection, and with very few destroyers, capital ships will be seriously up against it. I found dodging the torpedoes quite interesting and entertaining, until in the end they started to come in from all directions, and they were too much for me. Prince of Wales and Repulse had both been without serious anti-aircraft practice for some months, and I'm afraid the shooting was not good. Torpedoes were mostly fired outside pom-pom range at about 2,500 yards. I am convinced that we have all got to realize that bursts behind the target of short-range anti- I am convinced that we have all got to realize that bursts behind the target of short-range AA fire, which were missing astern, is just a waste of time and might as well be thrown over the side. I believe that 90% of short-range stuff that is being fired at any aircraft goes behind them. Thank you for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy the content, and I'll see you in the next one.